Hey everyone, Chris Sawyer here. The Varietal Show is back. I am sitting here in, you got right, we're in a cave right now. This is my great friend, Tony Touchard. Uh, we are at uh, Truchard Family Winery right here in Carneros. I don't know if you guys know where Carneros is, but if you don't, you need to know because Carneros is the bottom uh, southwest section of Napa Valley. And here we are. Um, I want to say one thing about this year, this being 2023, if you're watching it this year uh, of this series. Um, it is the 40 year anniversary of the, the Appalachian, the American viticultural area called Carneros. This is the Los Carneros District, and this is the part of Napa Valley. So we call it the Napa Valley District part of Carneros. Um, it is divided, it was the first ever Appalachian divided into two different counties. That's a very interesting little uh, tidbit there for you, where it actually crossed county lines. And why is that? It's because we're so close to San Pablo Bay. We're looking right at the Bay Area right now, uh, right outside of uh, Tony's family's property here. And uh, being the Sonoma County boy that I was, I used to drive through here when I was a kid with my grandparents and they'd, they'd make me count sheep here. That's why it's called Carneros, the Ram. And when Tony and I were kids, there was just a bunch of sheep here. There were not as many vines, I'll tell you that. Wouldn't you agree with me, Tony? Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah, growing up here, I mean, we were one of the few vineyards in around all of our neighbors. To go visit our neighbor, I would cut through a sheep field or yeah. cattle field. Yeah. So uh, the great thing about Tony and I, we've just known each other. You know, we, we've both got in the business. I mean, he was born into the business, but I got to know Tony a long time ago when we were back in the 90s and the early 2000s. I've really watched this brand become a brand. Before that, they were really known best as farmers. And it's a funny thing because your dad's a doctor and your mom is, is one of the greatest moms I've ever met in my life. And they came here really to be farmers first, did they not? 100%, 100%. I mean, my mom would be the first to tell you, they weren't blind people when they came here. They just loved farming and they loved viticulture. And um, when they got out here, they were like, oh, what do you farm? You farm grapes, okay. And then after selling to a lot of the top names, of course, they're interested in, hey, where are these grapes going? So, like, uh, they're going to Duck Run. Let's try some Duck Run. They're going to Heights. Let's try some Heights. And so after about 10 years, they're like, oh, this wine stuff's actually really good. <laughs> and then it got to be the point where you started making wine, too. What was the first vintage that you guys bottled? Yeah, so our first vintage was in 1989. Okay. Uh, so from 74, when we planted the vines, uh, 77 was our first harvest. But from 77 to 70 or 89, we sold all of our grapes. And then in 89, we, uh, we bought a thousand cases of little Chardonnay, Pinot, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. And they've moved on. Let's just put it that way. We are tasting right now the uh, new vintage of the Roussan. This is a 2022 Roussan from Truchard family uh, estate right here on the estate. I want to say something really amazing about this wine and uh, this past vintage. Um, I judge a lot of competitions, you guys might know that. Uh, this won the best white of all the American Fine Wine uh, competition at the American Fine Wine competition that we do in Miami at the beginning of the year. This won top white wine. And there's just something about um, Roussan, a lot of people don't know what Roussan is. It is basically the Rhone Valley's equivalent to a Chardonnay. It, it's not only just great the way it tastes, it tastes like a lot of fruit flavors and all these kinds of things, but it can get fairly complex too. Um, and it's not really known for California, but it's become something of a, once you get some, it's because of Viognier, a little bit of Marsan, Roussan, uh, new stuff with Grenache Blanc, Pic Pool Blanc, things like that. Those are all Rhone varieties. You guys have done such a great job with this. Not only this, but you've also become known for your Syrah. What got you kind of into the Rhone stuff too? You know, really, it started with the Syrah and we, um, so we have a fairly large property now. It's about 400 acres. We went, didn't buy it all at one time. And in the late 80s, we were planting a really steep hillside. You know, the first thing you do when you uh, cultivate the vines is you uh, cultivate the soil, you dig up the soil to give the new roots space to uh, grow. And on the steep hillside, when we broke up the soil, the only thing that came up were rocks. Uh, totally different than the majority of our property. Most yes. of our property was clay based, yeah. you know, Chardonnay, Pinot would grow there, Merlot would grow there, but we saw all these rocks. And we're like, okay, well, this is a little different than the rest of our property. Yeah. What, uh, yeah. what should we do? And uh, one of our distributors was like, you know, I was just in France a couple weeks ago and this looks like Cote Rocky. 
my dad at the time was like, I don't even know what they grow in Tote Roti. So he was like, oh, I think Syrah. So my dad went to the store, got a couple of bottles of Tote Roti, Amortage, some California Syrahs. I'm like, this is really good. So we planted four acres of Syrah on that hillside and fell in love with it. And then, uh, you know, fast forward 10 year, more years, we're like, okay, Syrah grows well here. We have another hillside that's kind of the same. What should we plant? Um, and it was a little bit like we wanted to do a white rum variety. And so we looked at Viognier, Marsan, and Roussan. And almost like uh, Goldilocks and uh, the Three Bears, you know, we tasted all the Roussans. Or the, started with the Viognier's and the Viognier's from California. Sometimes, you know, they get a little aromatic, a little ripe, a little... A little bit yeah. sugary, actually. Yeah. yeah. And they're actually, it's the worst one. you got to pick it on the right day I'm or you're screwed. Uh, yeah, there's some out there, but it's like for our style... There's there are stuff. Don't get me wrong. We're, we're definitely more about elegance and restraint. restraint. Yes. Uh, we're like, these, uh, these Viognier's are just too big. And then the Marsons, there's really not a lot out there, but our, they were just a little one-dimensional for us. Yeah. And then we tasted the Roussons, we're like, hey, this is just right. And so we planted uh, three acres of uh, Roussons. We got the cuttings from uh, down in Cabos Creek. And this has really become one of our uh, favorite wines. I was getting a little nervous with uh, Chris boasting about it because we don't tell people we're sold out of this yeah, wine. Yeah. We're, we're drunk out. Yeah, yeah. And like, if you talk too much about it, we're not even going to have enough to drink. I know. So you have to wait for the next vintage. But that's one of the many reasons you get to know True Shard. And this is really something that's new for them. So I just wanted to really give them a super compliment. He and I are going to be at the awards ceremony next week. For that, and uh, they deserve it. This is an amazing white wine. It was very different than Chardonnay, very different than Sauvignon Blanc. That Napa Valley is very well known for both of those, but and your family is very well known for their Chardonnay, believe me. But this is just something special. This is where we're going in America, and what we're finding we can do here. And Tony is absolutely a hundred percent right. These rocks that I just showed you, uh, these are from the hillsides here. And people think about Carneros in a strange way because it's, so, it's not like the rest of the valley. And that's right. That's why it became one of the first sub-appellations of, of California. Uh, we, and what separated from the bigger part of Napa Valley and the borders of Sonoma and Napa um, is just clay is based here right along the, the between us and the, the bay yeah, right yeah. there. It's directly south of us. That's all clay, pretty much. Yeah, we're, 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 sitting, we're sitting on the clay. We're, yeah. we're, we're, yeah. we're yeah. immersed in the clay, but, yeah. but there's, on the hill sides, yeah, there's a fault line that goes right through our property, and on the end of that uh, fault, we can get all these volcanic soils, and that's why we can do stuff like Syrah and Roussan and Zinfandel and stuff that you, you're not going to find, and we're not the only ones. There's little outcroppings in Hudson and Hyde and a few other vineyards yeah. here as well. Yeah, fantastic stuff. This is a great one to start out with. So, red wines, uh, if you think about Carneros, what's the first thing you guys think about when you think about Carneros? Well, for me, I would definitely say Pinot Noir. Of course it is. Because cool climate conditions, and this was really where the first blocks of Pinot Noir were planted in, in California history uh, with um, Judge Staley, just down the road from us here, and we're talking about back in the 1870s, 1880s, uh, experimenting with Chardonnay, Pinot Noir here, and it kind of caught on after the 60s really started. I mean, there was some great experimentation that went on here in the 70s. Uh, we give some great credit to so Francis uh, Mahoney and, and some of the great people that were real pioneers here. But you guys just started growing it, and you had something here where you're selling it to all these people, making them look great, you know, and it really started to prove things. And we might have known it a lot of people might know Carneros the best for, because of sparkling wine, because water are the two main ingredients in sparkling wines. If it's done in the champagne style, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and it works here. We know that because it don't make Carneros, don't make Chandon, Gloria Ferrer, all these great producers here. But Pinot Noir is something special. You pulled out a cool bottle here, yeah. um, and you know they're they're known for. Um, and we're going to taste Merlot. Believe me, Merlot is the key to here. If you really love Merlot from the United States. I will argue any time that this is the best area to grow it in, or uh, have a lot of different examples. You know, we can go up to Duckhorn's uh, uh, three three palms and really go. That's amazing. It's really great. But the fact is, there's only this much of it. This is more. You guys helped prove that Merlot's cool. Let's talk about uh, Pinot Noir first. What What do you really love about Pinot Noir and why it works here? Yeah, I, I love the aromatics about Pinot Noir. To me, Pinot Noir is always about the beauty of the aromatics. And um, obviously why it works here, like Chris was saying, we're cooler, we got clay soils. I mean, the big challenge with Pinot Noir for most people is that it ripens so soon. 
Um, it's definitely the first variety to ripen on our property. It ripens about 10 days earlier than, say, our Chardonnay or Merlot. Those are the next two varieties to come in. And Chardonnay just need, our Pinot Noir just needs that coolness to develop some more intense flavors. Obviously, we don't want it to be um, any warmer because then it's just going to ripen too quickly. So I think, you know, in those cool mornings, not getting uh, too hot in the afternoon is what makes Pinot Noir work here. And even on our property, we don't have a lot of Pinot Noir uh, planted because a lot of our property, we feel, is just too warm. We kind of have this tucked into uh, you know, east-facing hillsides, little valleys that are not going to get a lot of intense sun or a lot of intense heat. We want that Pinot Noir to preserve that freshness. And... Um, so I really think that's the beauty. And Chris was mentioning uh, Francis Mahoney. So uh, it's interesting you mentioned him while we're tasting this wine. One of our great heroes. Yeah, so this is uh, what we call our old block Pinot. So this is the first block that we planted here in Canaries in 1974. And any guess where we got the cuttings from? Francis Mahoney. Yeah. So I always think of Francis Mahoney, and I, I, I wasn't born with the story when, uh, when, we, when he t told us this, but... It reminds me of Field of Dreams because my dad was looking around going, I need to buy my land, but I can't find a Ford land in Rutherford or uh, Oakville. It's just, you know, it's too expensive. I'm, you know, fresh from Texas. I don't, uh, I haven't started my medical practice, uh, but I'd love to buy something in Napa. And uh, Francis was like, well, what about Canaries? You know, it's great for Chardonnay and Pinot. And he basically said, if you plant it, I'll buy it. Yeah. So like, if you build it, they will come. If you plant it, uh, I'll buy it. And so we uh, planted <laughs> those 20 acres and he was our first customer until uh, for the first four years. The problem is he didn't know my dad was gonna keep buying more and more and more <laughs> land. So after a while, he was like, Tony, I, I can't keep growing my label that much. So <laughs> then we started selling down the wineries as well. But uh, yeah, Francis is, definitely been a mentor to our family and uh, so this is made with the uh, old martini clone that we got yeah. from Francis. And, and I want to say one thing about the martini clone and where it came from. It really was the Louis Martini family, William Martini, that purchased this property right out here um, which has now got the property with um, auberges on it and, and the, the new auberge uh, hotel and stuff. That was the original planning by um, Judge Staley. And uh, actually, when the um, after Prohibition and the Martini family purchased it, that's where this real the clone became tested, and it became the Martini clone because that the Pomard clone was really birthed there too, and as was the Wenty clone was tested there. So these are the ones prior to all the we talk about all these fancy Dijon clones with all the numbers one fifteen six six seven 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 eight two eight. Those are all UC Dave or sorry. Uh, University of Oregon, or uh, sorry, OSU. Let's not get the ducks and the beavers confused. They get pissed. But that came from the north, um, and it came from Dijon. This was more the selections that were brought here, really tested here by UC Davis and right out here. And this is a really special thing. And what Francis Mahoney did was really an amazing, uh, intensive tasting and, and uh, a 10 year period where these. Uh, vines were grown on his property, Carneros Creek um, brand, and uh, he really helped make these clones what they are today. He's an amazing man, still alive. I will interview him. You can bet before this year's over, Francis Mahoney is going to be. I know he wins. Yeah, yeah, he's great. And he, like him, uh, like us, he, he preserves himself with fine wines, and that's how he stays alive for this long. And that's how we do it. Um, but fantastic wine. I'm really so glad. I don't really get to taste this that much because this is that old block. It's a very special block of, of grapes. You know, this is the oldest on this whole vineyard. Yeah, we, have, we only have four acres of this, and it yields about a half a ton per acre. So basically like 30 uh, cases per ton per acre. So not a lot is made. Um, and it was just something that we decided to make about 10 years ago because we were like, well, it tastes so good and so intense, and we want to preserve the legacy, but we can't just continue to blend it into our estate. Pinot Noir and kind of lose the individual identity of this wine. And so we started bottling it as kind of a standalone block, a single site selection about uh, 11 years ago. Amazing stuff, you guys. It's just great, great texture, great, you know, uh, in the old days, I would say that there was some, my only problem with Carneros Pinot Noirs is they were kind of a little bit bitter, like they got big. 
And um, I really feel like everyone has learned so much more about growing practices. We've learned that how the sun works better. We've learned how our conditions are not ever going to be the same every year. They never will happen. And you can never bet on that. And it's better farming practices. And I think you guys really were the emblem of, of people that came and invested in this area not really having any background in the wine industry, but really love following their passion here and wanting to be farmers. And you guys have done a great job to help everyone else. Yeah, thank you. No, that's one of the great things in the wine industry is that we all work together to, you know, make better wines and, you know, educate people about what we're doing. Yeah. Great stuff. Well, let's try some Merlot here, too. Let me pass me that fabulous bottle. Uh, tell us a little bit about your Merlot program. All right. So, you know, we, uh, Chris was doing a brag on Canaries, and we're talking about how it's cool, great for, uh, you know, basically Chardonnay and Pinot. We're kind of the forefather grapes here. And uh, it, it, when we first came, though, my dad was like, well, my property in Napa. I don't want to plant Chardonnay and Pinot. I don't think he even knew what Pinot was. To be <laughs> I don't think anyone did that. Uh, but he, but he, you know, he was listening to Francis, and he, he was like, I want to plant some Cabernet. And Francis said, well, Tony, if you plant Cabernet, you should plant some Cabernet Franc and Merlot as well, because yeah. if the Cabernet Sauvignon doesn't fully ripen, Merlot ripens about a month early, and you can blend that in. And, and so we did. We planted Cabernet back in, or Merlot back in 74, and it's almost like a blending grape. Uh, but you know, in the mid '80s, Merlot started taking off, and we started selling a lot of Merlot to um, Mind uh, Mandavi, uh, yeah. Frogsley, Doug Foran, and then Michael Havens, who became our first winemaker. Oh, Michael Havens, yeah. the great Michael Havens. I will give that man a lot of credit. He helped me love Merlot too. I mean, one of the great Merlot producers. Um, you know, still a great consultant, still a great mind in our heads. Um, and really Cabernet Franc, another one, you know, you talk about some of the great ones. Yeah, so I mean, he's yeah. the one that really crafted this wine. I mean, we, we've been growing Merlot on our property long before we ever met Michael. But when we first started our, uh, the first vintage in 89, he was our winemaker and he was like, well, this is how I feel like we should make Merlot. Um, Canaris really reminds me of the right bank of Bordeaux. I think we should True. kind of go after a Saint Emilion style with you know, a lot of Cabernet Franc. You know, the Merlot is a little slower to ripen here, which is great, but the Cabernet Franc will give it some nice aromatics. And so right up to, every year we go right up to that limit of, you know, 25% Cabernet Franc. Uh, you know, 20 to 25%. And what really um, works in Canaries is somehow that those clay soils just give Merlot a little bit more stuffing, a little more texture, a little more tanning. You're not going to get those soft, fruity uh, Merlots that you might find up valley or in other parts of california you're gonna find merlot that tastes like right bank bordeaux that has some ageability to it one of the great uh winemakers and growers here in, in napa valley steve Mathiason, once told me an amazing thing he said chris you can grow cab just about anywhere in napa valley but you can't grow merlot just anywhere the reason he says that is because in bordeaux the, the left bank, even though it's closer to the ocean, is actually much warmer. And it's because it's protected by the largest sand dune in all of Europe. And so the wind can't come directly at it. This area, it's known as wind. <laughs> I mean, every day, 3.30, it starts to be windy here. And that is exactly what the right bank in Bordeaux is. It is actually where the, the winds come in from the Atlantic, and in this case, it comes in from the Pacific. And it really rushes right through here. And it's going into the uh, mainland of Europe in that case. And in here, it's coming into the middle of California. And so this is really something that they were really on to, especially Michael Havens. And he, Michael also just right down the road from us here is the Great Hudson Vineyard. And that's where uh, Michael really started growing grapes there too with Lee Hudson. And, you know, we really, it's something that you don't really think about with Carneros, but you should be thinking way more about it. And... Forget sideways, you guys. He's drinking, um, <laughs> you know, Cheval Blanc at the end, which is Merlot, if you didn't get that whole inside joke. Um, but the fact was, I think it was a statement in that movie about Merlot, that Merlot was becoming a commodity. And there was just too much Merlot out there. It wasn't being grown in the right places. And the fact is, they should have just been drinking more um, Carneros anyways. Right? <laughs> I say that all the time. But it's, it's a true statement of fact that this is an area that's got so much more similarities to that Merlot region than others. And I think that's really what it's about. So it's very special. 
Um, and it's a great thing to be doing right now is tasting this with this fine man. So, um, uh, you know, this is just an amazing experience with you once again. Uh, every time I come here to True Shard, and you guys can come here anytime you want, look up trueshard.com and, um, you know, all the things that you guys do and you taught me, your family, just as great growers and your mom came out to greet me when I arrived. God, I just wanted to cry because as I hugged her because she's just such a wonderful woman. And you're just such a dear friend of mine, but I want people to know about this brand. And I think that Carnero is celebrating its 40 year anniversary this year. I'm working on my book, which has a whole chapter on Carnero's. Um, we love Carnero's. Carnero's is lovable for everyone. And I, I think these are three great wines to really push this across the everyone. Of course, thanks for the kind words and uh, thanks for the little surprise visit. It's, uh, <laughs> exactly. it's always good to see you. Always good to see you too, brother. Cheers, Thank you. Friends. Cheers. Here, here.